Hello, um, this is Lauren Kennedy speaking from Neighborhood Villages from behind this slide. We will get started in just about two minutes as we uh, admit everybody from the waiting room. Great, okay, it looks like we have hit a good stable participation um, entry point. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm Lauren Kennedy and uh, joined by Amy O'Leary from Strategies for Children, as well as a, a number of spectacular uh, early education and care providers. And we're here to talk about the Commonwealth Cares for Children Stabilization Grant Program um, to give a bit of an overview of the landscape of the early education and care sector and the incredibly critical role that these stabilization grants have played, um, not just in stabilizing the field, but also in setting us towards a path uh, for how we can really think about building a stronger early education and care system going forward. So with that, I'll hand it to you, Amy. Thanks so much, Lauren. It's so great to be here. Um, and we just wanted to run through the agenda today. So um, we will give you the landscape of early education and care in Massachusetts. We'll talk more about the C3 grant program and the impact of them. We'll hear about kind of our vision moving forward, thinking about this direct to provider grant funding as a mechanism for referral. And then we're gonna hear from an amazing panel of providers from across the state to, to, to hear more about the impact the C3 grant has had on their uh, programs and their vision for going through the, uh, as we look toward the future. As we get started though, we would love folks to introduce themselves in chat so if you uh, can click chat right now, we have it open and um, you can tell us where you're um, zooming in from. We'd love to hear your name and, and the name of your program and where you're zooming in from. And then throughout the session today, if you are an educator or a program director and you want to let us know through chat what these stabilization funds have meant to you as a director, as an educator, um, we would love to collect that information through chat. So we'll keep the chat open uh, so people can introduce themselves and then also share a little bit about why this funding has made such a difference in your program. I guess that's what they would call a leading question <laughs> if I were in court. Um, I will turn it over to Lauren who will kick us off. Of, and Oh, the other piece to remember is as we're going through, we'll use the Q&A function if folks have specific questions that they want to ask. Um, either of Lauren or I, or of our panelists as we get started there. So Lauren, I'll turn it back to you. Great. So just to give us some framing for this conversation, and then later on in the presentation, we'll dive into each of these. Um, but for you know the past, it started in, in June of 2021, July of 2021. So it feels like 100 years, uh, but more like, 15 months or so, not 15 months, I'm sorry, nine months or so, um, we have had these C3 stabilization grants um, launched in, in Massachusetts. And what we've really seen is they had almost an immediate impact on stabilizing the early education and care field uh, in, in Massachusetts. And so as we'll walk through the data on what was the impact of these grants, we'll see that it's really critical uh, for sustaining the care system that we have and making sure that we don't go back to where we were um, between March 2020 and the launch of these C3 grants, where unfortunately we saw a huge decline in the number of licensed providers in Massachusetts. And we'll talk a bit about how the stabilization grant program prioritizes equity um, to ensure that we are prioritizing uh, lower income families and higher needs communities. Uh, we'll also talk about how it has supported um, providers' ability to keep their doors open and demonstrated that this funding stands as a successful mechanism for sector reform. Um, so as we get started, I'll just give a quick overview of the, oh, and I should say, we are also here today um, to, to, to really double down on this ask that we are making 
uh, with respect to the fiscal year 2023 budget to see an extension of the Commonwealth Cares for Children Stabilization Grant through the end of the fiscal year and maintaining eligibility for all licensed early education and care providers while prioritizing those programs that serve high needs children. So the ask that the field is making uh, again is that we see $480 million so that we can extend this grant program for one more fiscal year. So now moving on um, to the landscape. And I'll start with uh, a look at the uh, capacity of the uh, early education and care sector in Massachusetts. Right now, uh, we have a capacity to serve 220,000 uh, children that are in licensed uh, childcare slots across uh, EEC providers, family child care, center-based, uh, out of school time for uh, school-aged children. And of that 220,000, about 43,000 uh, children are currently enrolled in the state's child care subsidy program. Um, unfortunately, we are not serving nearly as many subsidy eligible children uh, as we would like to. And so another you know, major component of uh, how the field is thinking about improving access and improving public investment in the Massachusetts early education and care sector is this question of how do we make sure that all children who are subsidy eligible are able to obtain that subsidy and enroll uh, in care in Massachusetts. And so this next slide is basically just an illustration uh, of the, that, that same uh, set of data points, which is our capacity a bit over 220,000 of that 43,000 uh, of those children have a subsidy. And another way of looking at that, as we talk about the C3 grants and the importance of the landscape as a whole, is when we look at the population of kids in care, 80% of these kids do not have a subsidy. And so we need to look at the potential of the C3 grant and the impact it has on how we ensure access for all children across the state of Massachusetts so that they all have the early education that they deserve and families have the care solutions that they rely on in order to be able um, to go to work. And next we're gonna look at uh, supply. So in Massachusetts, we currently have uh, 7,578 licensed providers. Um, of that, 58% uh, have a child with a subsidy and 42% do not have a child with a subsidy. Um, so again, this being a breakdown of when we look at the field of early education and care, we have a substantial number of programs with a child on a subsidy, but we also have a substantial number of programs that don't, um, that, have, that are also in need of significant support in order to keep their programs open while we continue to weather the uncertainties brought on by the pandemic. I think a very important thing to note about the percentage of, of EEC providers who don't currently have a child um, with a subsidy is that more than 3,000 programs are still serving socially vulnerable communities. Um, so while a child may not have a subsidy, they're operating in a community um, that's that's you know, maybe higher, higher risk, lower income. And so we really do need to uh, put in place policies that protect uh, those programs as well. And in the deck here, and we'll, we'll send it up uh, after the presentation, but that hyperlinks to how the CDC defines socially vulnerable communities. And lastly, um, what has the impact of COVID-19 been on the early education and care sector? Since March of 2020, we have lost uh, 1,400 licensed programs. Um, you can see the breakdown of the percentage that were center-based, and unfortunately, um, we lost a lot of family child care providers. And what this you know, sort of all accumulates to is that we lost 17% of our child care capacity, losing upwards of 23,000 licensed child care slots, right? So that means um, those are children who are no longer able to participate in care, families who don't have access to those child care solutions. Uh, so again, really the importance of the C3 stabilization grants 
in helping providers stay open. Um, hopefully, you know, as we look to the future of the C3 grants, these direct to provider funding mechanisms can also play a role in growing capacity, bringing us not just back to where we were pre pandemic, um, but really helping encourage more providers to open in the field so that we can care for, for more children. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Amy, to walk us through the details of the stabilization grant program. Thanks so much, Lauren. And for that landscape, it's been great to see folks introducing themselves in chat, sharing what the grant has meant to them. So please keep that going uh, as we are talking and as you hear from panelists. Um, I also wanna recognize that um, at Strategies for Children, we uh, have worked in partnership with the state. Sometimes we call ourselves a critical friend as advocates where we wanna make sure the state succeeds and also, you know, think about how we can support the work of the department and of state government, and then how to empower and have folks recognize their own power and their own advocacy. And so I know we have on the call today, Addison um, Coley from the Department of Early Education and Care, who has, who has helped us think about um, how to look at the data of the C3 grantees. And we'll talk more about some opportunities we have to look at what the funding levels are going into every district and uh, legislative district in Massachusetts. And so and part of our work at Strategies is monitoring uh, the federal and the state uh, budgets. And so what we saw during the pandemic were you know, increased funds from the federal government to help support and stabilize many sectors in our country, including uh, early education and care. So Massachusetts received, in addition to other dollars, $314 million uh, and the American Rescue Plan, the Child Care Stabilization Grant Program. And Massachusetts you know, made the decision to create this Commonwealth Cares for Children formula, was created to distribute the funds to support day-to-day -day operations and to ensure the availability of care for families in Massachusetts. We saw other policies put into place in Massachusetts, like paying for enrollment and not attendance, about supporting families through the pandemic and not charging a parent fee. And this was another one of the supports that went to all, that was available for all licensed program. And this influx of funds has really provided us an opportunity to first see some of the dreams come true that we know that we need, whether there's a pandemic or not, and to really think about how we are using funding to support programs across the board. So you can see how do we evaluate the impact of this license capacity based financing model. In the early days of the grant strategies also worked with the department and we provided technical assistance to programs who wanted to apply. And we saw, we saw an impact from those sessions that more programs applied. So we can go to the next slide, Marissa, thank you. And so when you look at the formula, this really is the first kind of mechanism we've had in a long time in Massachusetts that considers the program's license capacity, their staffing levels, and the vulnerability of the community that they serve. I saw in the chat, there was a question about why more children don't have subsidies. And it's a function both of the dollar, the, the amount of available dollars for subsidies, and then the eligibility right now that we have um, for a family to be able to be eligible for subsidies. So the C3 formula really looked at that and, and kind of went bigger and broader so that all eligible providers received a base amount. So everybody got it the same base, which was big, not the same base, excuse me, a base that was uh, connected to the license capacity. So if you had 50 children enrolled, if you had 70 children enrolled, and then looking at the staffing costs that you had. So it really appreciated your, your program size as it looked at uh, creating that base funding amount. And then the using the social vulnerable index that uh, providers then received an, an equity adjustment. And that was, if you can see, was the program is located in historically marginalized communities and that they're uh, providing services uh, to significant numbers of low-income children. And we know subsidy is one measure of, of how we can look at uh, the, the low-income children in Massachusetts, but we know that the social vulnerability index is another way to look at this. And it really looks at the location of where the programs are. We also know in early education and care that a family could live in one community and have a program in another community. 
And so it really appreciates the differences of, of, of how that might look in supporting through funding. And you can see how the equity adjustment was calculated. Uh, there, if you really want to know, there's a, a lot more detailed wonky slides to show you. But basically, there was a the base amount, then the equity adjustment really equals what fund what providers are getting month by month um, in Massachusetts. We also know that there's been, and we've seen it in the chat already, that these dollars have been used to support the workforce, whether it was one-time bonuses um, or you know uh, adding on to, to folks' salaries. We also know the anxiety of <laughs> if you are running a program and you want to make sure the funding that you're putting in this year will be available for next year, which is why we are working so hard to advocate for the continuation of these grants for next year. We also know that people are really trying to figure out what the, you know, their eligibility looks, excuse me, their, their capacity looks like as families are returning back to work and what that means for the numbers in your program. So we can go to the next slide. So to learn a little bit more about the initial impact, and I think one area where we've seen the Department of Early Education and Care make a commitment is to better understand how this funding is being used, what supports it is providing, and then what could this look like in the future. So as you can see, nearly 84% of the state's 7,500 programs are participating. That's an incredible uh, response rate. We know it could be higher, but it was really incredible to see how hard people worked so quickly to get this happening in their own programs. We know it's for family child care programs and after school and out of school time providers, as well as uh, birth programs that are serving, center based that are serving um, children as well. We see that family child care providers provide, uh, represent the majority of programs receiving the grants. Now, this is really important to think about. From July 2021 to December 2021, which is when the program, uh, the six months of our, the first window, only 453 programs have closed and 98% of programs that closed did not receive the C3 funding. And then only seven programs that closed did take the C3 funding. And we know the C3 funding was, was, that, was meant to be the stabilization. We also know, and we're hearing from folks every day that the crisis is not over. You know, educators are continuing to have COVID, staffing shortages are still impacting classes. And now as we think about the future of work, uh, what does that look like and what does that mean? We know these dollars are making a difference. And uh, you can see by the data what difference it made in that first six month period. So we can go to the next slide. So you can see we have really focused on equity. The C3 funding formula has a prioritization of equity with 65% of all C3 grant funding already going to programs that have a subsidy. As of November, 2021, the providers serving the most socially vulnerable areas received 30% of all funding distributed by the C3 grants. This is just a different way of looking at the data. When you think about kind of the, the, the rings of support and eligibility. So for subsidized programs, they're receiving um, resources. And then this is kind of the next band of support. And you can see that the median per slot grants to providers, an area of high need is 30% greater than grants uh, in providers of relative affluence. And this was really meant to th think about how do we look at uh, the state as a whole? How do we make sure that we are serving the most vulnerable children first and then providing additional support for programs that uh, are kind of in that in-between where they don't um, have a subsidized child or a contract with the state, but they are serving families who would otherwise be eligible. And so we know, and, and as we know, the state budget process is happening right now. So the governor released the state budget in January. We know that the, our Massachusetts House of Representatives and our state Senate are working on their budget proposals now. So we know that these grants are pivotal to continue first stabilization and then thinking about sustainability. We know that there will be an impact if programs do not have the, these funds available. And right now, as you saw, 42% of programs don't have subsidies. And that could be uh, for many different reasons. And 32% of providers that don't have subsidies are in social vulnerable communities. 
as we thought about kind of the, the before times, subsidy and eligibility was really one way that we had to measure um, need, economic need for children and families. This index, which is not just being used by Massachusetts, it was used by many states during the pandemic to really get a better handle on families that would need support and where they fell across the states. And we also know that 30% of all closures in Massachusetts from March 2020 to January 2022 were among uh, programs in high social vulnerability areas that did not participate in the subsidy system. And what we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, was a lot of attention on how early education and care programs were funded and how fragile state, the budgets of, were, of those programs, how limited uh, savings and reserves programs had, and how real the reality became that programs would just simply have to close because they didn't have, uh, you know, reserves or operating funds. We also know that the burden on families in Massachusetts is high for uh, paying out of pocket for um, early education. So the grants we see, um, this idea of having funding to support programs has shown up in many different policies over the year. We just believe that with this, this focus on equity is very important to consider as we think about the long-term sustainability and growth for our sector. And then we also, and you're seeing it in the chat about uh, the, the what providers use the funding for. You can see that many programs almost all use the funds right away to sustain operations, that they needed uh, that funding to kind of keep going for three months, and that more than half of center-based uh, use the funds for compensation, either ongoing or one-time, and that overall 30% of funds have been used for benefits and wages. And this is very important to think about. We have not had many mechanisms in early education and care to really think about how can we best support the compensation of educators in programs. We know programs try so hard to prioritize this and that most of their expense goes to the workforce. But we know that with limited uh, public funding and not being able to kind of raise parent fees to match the funding that would, they would be needed, um, that this, this provided an opportunity to test some of the, our, our ideas and theories out. And as we can see with the data, that's where programs really were spending the money to support the people, as well as these operational costs that, that somebody, we have to really think about for the sustainability of programs. So I'm going to turn it back to Lauren for this, uh, this to talk more about this direct to provider grant as funding uh, mechanism for reform. So Lauren, great. So I think you know what is exciting about what we've learned from these past six plus months of the uh, C3 stabilization grant program is that this really does set the stage for a funding mechanism um, that can put us on a pathway towards, uh, you know, sort of a more stable, stronger early education and care system where our providers have more predictability about the revenue that they need uh, to sustain their operations costs and make long-term investments in their uh, workforce, their early educators, their administrative staff, because they won't, again, be completely reliant on tuition dollars coming in from families, which can right, feel very unpredictable. How can I make an investment uh, in, in raising the, the salaries of my educators if I don't know that I'll be able to sustain it if I think my enrollment might drop uh, between you know, sort of point time A and, and point time B. If you have a grant coming in um, to provide a certain percentage of those operations costs that persist, even if your enrollment fluctuates, you have greater financial predictability to make those long-term investments. Uh, we know that in this moment, we are in a workforce crisis in early education and care. We have got to put in public funding mechanisms that support our providers in raising educator wages so that we can recruit and retain incredible talent. Um, and I think it's fair to say many providers feel at this moment that they simply can't compete 
because if the you know sort of average one can pay an early educator in Massachusetts is somewhere between you know 17 and 19 dollars an hour one can go work at Target for 24 and so how do we think about the success of the direct to program grant funding both in terms of yes stabilizing the field but also providing opportunity to make investment in educator wages make investment in facilities because you have this more predictable source of revenue how can we build on that um, to start to work towards a more uh, stable early education and care system that really promotes growth, promotes more providers coming into the field, um, promotes more educators wanting to come into the field so that we can finally meet the needs, um, the demand that, that children and families have on being able to participate in early learning programs. So right, what we've really talked a lot about today is the critical role that C3 grants have played in stabilization. And looking at this next fiscal year, which would take us through June of 2022, as still being in emergency circumstances. If we remove this funding, as the data shows, we have a high likelihood of losing a significant number of programs, particularly those who are located in more socially uh, vulnerable uh, areas. And as we move from, and I'm sorry, we could go to the next slide. Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of gloss over it because I think I've, I've hit most of these points, um, is while we think about stabilization, how do we have an eye towards the future, um, which brings us to sustainability. That the improvements that we've made don't all end at the end of, of fiscal year 23, but we really sustain that public funding and begin to build on it so that we can get to our providers um, you know, sufficient funds to make competitive uh, raises a possibility so that they can offer benefit packages to their educators while also making investments in operations, in administrative staff, in facilities, so that again, um, in Massachusetts, we are leading the way on supporting really high quality programs and promoting the opportunity for new providers to come into the field so that we can get all of Massachusetts children into phenomenal early learning programs. This direct to provider funding uh, has really demonstrated that it can have an incredible um, impact on being able to move us in that direction. Um, we also hear from programs, if we could just go back really quickly, that this type of uh, revenue, direct to program revenue that helps to offset operations expenses, supports provider ability to enroll children with a subsidy. Many providers say, I want to be able to enroll a child with a subsidy, but I can't do it based on how funding is coming into my program right now. Or unfortunately, many programs saying, I used to enroll children with subsidies and I can't afford to do it anymore that a big you know, sort of way that we get to improving access for children with subsidies, for children in more vulnerable communities is providing our programs with the financial support that they need to know that they can sustainably begin to enroll children with subsidies. So I think that this is also a really important point that this funding isn't just about stabilizing or sustainability, it's also about growing access um, for the children most in need of participation in early learning programs. And then lastly, I mentioned, um, you know, what are our growth goals with respect to C3 funding over time? Um, there's a huge potential for thinking about this as permanent policy and how it might help meet our goals around expanding access for lower income children, enhancing parent affordability, right? Without revenue coming in, in a direct to program way, you're completely reliant on tuition to cover your costs, which means if I'm a provider and my business expenses go up, I have no choice but to pass that off to parents um, through higher tuition. And we know in Massachusetts, I think that we uh, unfortunately have successfully made ourselves the most expensive state uh, in, in the United States in terms of how much it costs parents uh, for early education and care. We used to be behind Washington, D.C., and I, I think we may have unfortunately made it to first 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 place. So how do we think about direct to provider programming as a way to enhance parent affordability as well as access? 
And then additionally, how do we think about this funding as a way to finally, as, as Amy said, um, make these investments in compensation that we've been wanting to make for a long time? Um, and then lastly, uh, maintaining a focus on equity. So that is uh, an overview of you know, the landscape. Where are we? How did COVID-19 impact what our capacity looks like? Uh, how did the C3 stabilization grants play a really critical role in stopping program closures, in stabilizing, um, particularly programs in more vulnerable communities? Uh, and un the unfortunate consequences that we believe we can expect if the C3 funding program is not extended through fiscal year 23, again, bringing us to, to June 30th of um, this next year, of 2023. So with this, we, you know, you've heard a lot from Amy and myself, we've talked a lot. So I wanna pass it over to Amy to introduce um, the most part, uh, important part of this conversation, which is hearing directly from providers about what the impact of C3 grants has been for them. Thanks so much, Lauren. And we will um, turn it right over to our panelists. And first, I also wanna thank everybody for um, all of the great comments in chat, great questions. We know there's a lot of questions around just funding in general. And so we will make sure that we either answer them in chat. We will also include all of our emails uh, addresses so you can follow up with us. We also have a slide deck that has a lot more information that we can share that kind of goes into what the SEI, what the components are of that. Um, but first, I wanna get started with this panel discussion. And I'm so excited to welcome Anna, Lori, Jeanette, and we are so happy to have you. We have Ellen who's also joining us who, and, and you have to know that these folks who have joined us today are, you know, have eyes and ears going on behind them because they are short staffed. Many of them were worried about being able to join us, uh, but we wanted to make it as uh, panelist friendly as possible. So we are so grateful for your time, um, even more so of everything that we know is going on behind the scenes. So as we start, um, if you could just tell us all a bit about your program, how many children that you serve, where you're located, um, if you're a center based or family child care, and then if you just want to give us a headline is what uh, of the impact of the grant. So kind of those two introductory question and then the impact and we can go Anna, Lori and Janet and then uh, as Ellen joins I can uh, ask her as well. So I'll turn it over to Anna first. Sure. Hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Anna Goodkind and um, I'm currently the director of a small nonprofit school in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, and we serve 45 infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. What's interesting about our school is that we're partnered with a local independent school to provide quality childcare for the children of their faculty and staff, as well as also um, a lot of other families who work in other local independent and public schools and nonprofit organizations in our community and in Watertown and other nearby communities. Um, and so our school, it's while it's not one of the most expensive or one of the least expensive schools um, in the area, uh, many of our families are middle-class teachers themselves who are still paying over $20,000 a year for um, school year care for, for their infants and toddlers. Um, and the model we've always had has been, um, you know, the salaries of our faculty and staff is based on tuition. So, um, so if we wanted to raise um, salaries of staff, we would have to in turn raise tuition and um, our families really um, can't afford that at this point. So um, the funding has made a huge difference for us to be able to um, spend, we've spent about 70% of it on um, salaries, benefits, 
substitutes and support teachers, which are very necessary, um, as well as uh, something that I think is really important, which is um, professional development for our teachers and to help them kind of um, increase their education. We've done tuition reimbursement um, for them to grow in their practice in the field. Um, and we've been hesitant to raise our salaries as high as we would like to, uh, because we're not sure if this funding will continue. Do you want me to say more, or that's enough for now, right? Why don't we start with that headline, and we'll go to Lori and Janet. Thank you so much, Anna. Hello, ladies. It's nice to see everybody's smiling faces. Um, my name is Lori Smith, and I am in Athol and that's North Central, if you're not familiar. Um, I'm the director of Pre-K Kids, which includes Pre-K Tots underneath the umbrella. Um, we serve about 45 children ages 15 months through seven years old. Um, Athol is a very rural, low-income community. Um, we have a lot of families that are DCF involved. Um, 85% of our preschool classroom is subsidy and about 25% of our entire population is DCF involved. Um, so we, we really struggle with um, being able to afford just the overall um, cost of running our program because we accept so much subsidy. Um, and, you know, we really have wonderful staff and we want to be able to hold on to them and to be able to do that we have got to be able to pay them well. Um, so <sighs> you wanted to talk to me to talk more about my program or more and just tell us, you know, the impact that kind of high level of the impact of having the C3 grant. Um, so having this grant has been a lifesaver for us. We opened um, our preschool program opened in 2019. And then we opened the toddler program just in this past fall. Um, without this grant, this, the toddler program would absolutely be closed. Um, there is no way we'd be able to sustain it. We are in the red every single month without the grant. Um, so staff is already aware that if the grant doesn't continue, we will be closing the toddler program, unfortunately. Um, we are using it about 85% of the funding is going to pay staff. Um, and then the rest of it pretty much goes for maintenance, utilities, rent, all that important stuff that you can't get away from. Um, we, were, we were able to enact um, paid vacation, paid sick time for our staff. Um, we really would love to give some higher wages, but we just don't feel comfortable because we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. So it's, it's really important for us for paying our staff or we wouldn't be able to do it. But because we're serving such a high needs population, um, we cannot function, for example, our preschool room cannot function with just two teachers. We absolutely cannot. We have children that need one-on-one. -on -one. We have children on IEPs. Um, it's just, we have to have at least three to four teachers in that room. There's just no way we can do without it. So the, the grant you. is so important to us. Thank you. Jen, I'll turn it to you. Tell us a little bit about you and your program and other work that you do and um, about the impact of the grants. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yes, my name is Janet Montoya. I am a family child care educator, and uh, we are located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, our program, family child care, works very different as uh, center-based, and we work with mixed eight children. We have the capacity to have license for six, eight, or ten children, depending on uh, education, space, and number of assistants or adults uh, in the program. Uh, our program is a uh, full capacity with subsidized uh, families and without uh, the C3 grant, we will be, it will be impossible to support, for example, families that we have with uh, school age children. That means that they are part-time and uh, our families that are being in our program for 12 years already. So uh, for these families will be a, obviously a very hard situation to find another program and uh, the flexibility with the schedules. Uh, and obviously uh, for us as a business to have a additional assistance, uh, it will be impossible without the grant to have additional assistance to work with us.
two and a half years in, I'm muted. Thank you so much for just kind of that, that high level. I think, you know, as most of you know, Strategies for Children has been hosting a daily call. And recently on the call, we've heard two indicators. Uh, we had two program directors that said that during one of their family intakes, uh, the, the parents asked, how financially stable are you? I think uh, because the, um, you know, we are seeing the media report and we are seeing the situations of the fragility of programs, uh, you know, in the news that as people are thinking about enrolling their children and as, as, as Jeanette said, to think about having to find another program um, is really, um, is very emotional for families. But I, and, and both of the directors that we've talked to, one is Donna Danette, who's on the Zoom today, had never heard that question from families before. And so that's a pretty you know, interesting indicator to think it's on top of mind of families too. And we know there's always been this challenge of how come childcare costs so much and educators are paid so little. And we know that it's you know been decades of underinvestment of not enough public funds supporting this. And really thinking about, um, if you think about parents of young children, they're also at the beginning of their earning potential, right? And then they think of you know, their young parents trying to uh, manage all these costs. Ellen, welcome. This is like, this is your life surprise and welcome to the Zoom webinar. <laughs> We're just having folks share uh, a little bit about your program, how many children you serve, where you're located and just kind of high level, what has the C3 grant meant to you? So um, I am the director at Temple Beth Shalom in Needham. We have about a hundred children in our after school program, K to fifth and then, um, about 220 early childhood children. And um, what has it meant to us? Well, I, I think we, we don't have children on subsidy. Um, and so the, the income levels tend to be a little higher. All of our children come from homes where they can afford um, rent or mortgage and food and the, the basics. Um, and yet <laughs> they can't afford childcare. Um, and so, we, our tuition is already the highest it can be relative to our um, neighbors and our neighborhood. And um, yet our teachers are um, not making enough. We had a teacher, can I, can I share a story now or is that too? Yes. Okay, yeah, so um, just this week we had a teacher resign. He was um, teaching one of our elementary classes, an after school teacher, and he, um, broke up with a partner and needed to move. And he looked at rent in the area. He already lived in Worcester. So he already had about an hour commute each day. Um, but when he looked for a rental, he could afford like a one bedroom. He had to move two hours away to find anything he could afford. And so now he can't work with us anymore. We love him. We want to keep him, um, but we can't pay him enough to rent something in a reasonable driving distance. So that's one example and we're experiencing it over and over. And the grant has enabled us to really take a huge step in salaries. We used it for salaries and bonuses. Um, and so, but we're still paying at that level and it's still not enough, unfortunately, to live in the area. And we know this is decades of underinvestment, right? We also know that the landscape has changed, um, you know, where people really are thinking about this more as a public good. Um, and we also know that we've seen policies, we talked a little bit in the beginning about in this pandemic emergency, what we were able to um, kind of rely on from the federal government and our state. You know, I certainly don't want this uh, event to go through without us acknowledging all of the work that our elected leaders did do in Massachusetts. Um, you know, from the governor to the legislature to the commissioner at uh, the Department of Early Ed, that, that to really think about what's really happening on the ground, how can we make sure that um, our policies are aligned with what we're seeing and the need for right now. And I think now our job is to think about what does that look like going forward, to one, acknowledge that we are still in this, um, this pandemic and, and still in this crisis, but that we need to think about um, looking ahead. And so kind of using that as the um, as your frame for right now, can you talk about looking ahead or you know, if you're a director and you're working with your board, um, this awareness of the funding and fragility of early education and care in school age, I think is top of mind now, but what does that mean as you're planning your budgets going forward? Um, we've heard from you know directors saying like I can't I can't propose an unfunded budget a budget that where I want to raise salaries but I don't know where that money is going to come from. So can you talk about how you've navigated some of this like looking forward, 
Um, and I know anxiety, uh, what that brings on when you think about uh, the next few years in your programs. And anyone can start. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I think that, again, a big part of it is to not have it fall on the backs of the teachers and the parents who have been sticking with us through these last really, really challenging years. And I mean, our school is nearly 10 years old. It's a pretty new school. Um, and I mean, so for a little perspective, um, pre-pandemic, our biggest fundraiser brought in about $15,000 a year, which is like 10% of our operating budget. And then we haven't been able to run that for the last couple of years. So um, there's a lot of areas in which we're, we're not depending on um, income that, that we used to. And so um, we need something other than, other than the tuition. Um, and I say this as a, a toddler parent as well, who would not be able to afford to send my own child to school at the school that I direct if I didn't have a discount. Um, so, and I, and we've had staff in the past, um, you know, essentially pay to, to send their children to school if they had more than one child. Um, so, so we need to look elsewhere for the money, but um, the other piece of it too is um, thinking about uh, um, if, you know, proposing certain budgets that um, are able to keep our teachers and keep the, the ratios that we have, which is why people are attracted to, to our school. Um, and also value our teachers, right? So, um, essentially our teachers, well, our school year salaries at my school um, range from about, and it's a school year program, but range from about 32,000 at a starting salary to 46,000 um, with the hourly pay from like 22 to $31 an hour, which is pretty standard, but kind of on the higher end for this area even. But if you compare that to public school, preschool or kindergarten teachers who have a starting salary of 55,000 and then, you know, 100,000 with masters, that's kind of insultingly low considering that our teachers are doing unquestionably comparable work. Um, and so, um, you know, just providing them with bonuses is not enough. Right, they need they need higher salaries year to year that are sustainable. Um, and you know, next year we're looking at six percent raises because um, you know the cost of living has increased so high, and we want to try to keep up with that. Um, and giving them a five hundred or even two thousand dollar bonus here and there that's not going to do it. Our teachers need benefits, um, which we've pushed to be able to do, um, but need to be able to maintain. And then the big thing that I've been thinking a lot about is kind of a budget for professional development, um, offering tuition reimbursement to our teachers. Um, you know, we are having staffing shortages right now and, and teachers leaving the field, we lose like 20 to 30% of our teachers, even pre-COVID a year. Um, but I'm concerned about with current education staffing shortages, especially in early ed, um, that the field will start requiring less of their teachers um, and offering them then less respect and less compensation. And I think we need to turn around and kind of invest in these teachers. Um, many of our teachers have master's degrees or are working towards them, but are not able to afford them or have time for them because they're working here on low salaries and then, you know, at least one extra job. Um, but I think that we need to actually invest in kind of that education because it's an investment in the teachers, in the centers, and then in the families who are, are sending their, their kids there. So we've been using a lot of the, the grant money for that. And, um, and I think that needs to be an important part of the conversation as well. Thank you, Anna. And I think we could do many follow-up series on the workforce and best ways to support it, whether it's, you know, salaries, bonuses, paid vacation, we've seen the chat, paid health, uh, you know, healthcare benefits. Janet, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about for the future and any stress or anxiety that is, is inducing? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the cost, of, the cost of our programs right now is being increased by the basic needs and that obviously we need to survive. Uh, all of us, it doesn't matter if it's early childhood education, but the community in general is being impacted by the, by the inflation, especially in the last two years. And the cost, for example, to access quality 
for example, in a program, quality food programs for our children and families is being increased by 50, 100 uh, percent from two years ago. And one of the things that uh, as a field, I feel that the stress of not knowing if this run will continue is affecting the mental health of our field in general. And we need the stability in order, in order for us to make objective and responsible decisions in how we can keep supporting the children, the families and ourselves and our own families and us uh, like as a, as a small business owners. Thank you, Ellen, anything to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I think a lot about, I mean, I keep reading how many public school teachers are leaving the field. And I know that in um, Needham, the public school teachers are, have a starting salary of 53,000 and our teachers have a starting salary of 32. So I know that there's gonna be a lot of public school teaching positions open. The most qualified teachers will want the extra $20,000, they'll jump over there. And I think that the only people left for us to hire are going to be unqualified and not people that we'd be willing to entrust our children's learning with much less their safety and basic care. Um, and I worry that there just won't be a workforce, honestly. Lori, as we as we think about wrapping up now, kind of as you think about the future, what are you thinking about? You know, you shared that the toddler, this kind of like decision about a toddler classroom is in the in the lurch. And then if there's one thing that you you hope that people remember from today, what would that be? So the future is really scary to think about um, for us. Like I said, the decision's already been made that if the funding ends, we cannot keep our two toddler classrooms open. And that to me is really heart-wrenching because we're in such a high need community. Um, the owner put this program on Main Street so that people could access it. Um, and the families we have need us. And so the thought of having to close down um, and leave them all in a lurch really is upsetting. Um, and you know, the if we could probably keep continue to run our preschool classroom, but we may have to take away certain things that we've been put in place, like the paid vacation time and things like that. That is really important to keep our staff who are highly educated and experienced. Um, I think something that I would want to make a point of is just that um, I've had it written down too. Um, we're definitely not out of the woods when it comes to COVID. We're still being affected by COVID. Obviously staff and families still getting COVID and, and having to deal with the, the specifics around that. But from what we're seeing in our toddler program, the children that we have coming in that we're kind of saying our COVID, our COVID babies, um, these kiddos are coming in and 65% of our toddlers are in early intervention. Um, they're not talking, they're social and emotionally behind. And that's a big thing to me. COVID's not going anywhere as far as the, the impact it's had on programs. So I just really wanna stress that we're still trying to recover from that. And that's on top of what was already going on pre-COVID with early childhood. So it's only gonna get worse. Um, and this funding really makes a world of difference. It really does. Thank you so much, Lori. That's so powerful. So. Ellen, Anna, Janet, any kind of last final words from you? It's been so helpful to have your perspective. We are so grateful for the work that you're doing every single day and we are we are with you. <laughs> but any final thoughts as we as we as we end up our panel today? I mean, the thing that's kind of stuck with me throughout this whole process is that during the pandemic, um, people were finally recognizing kind of the importance of the work that we do, that we are essential workers. Um, and so I think that, I hope that people will continue to kind of acknowledge this importance of early childhood education and also that it's education and that education starts at birth and that there's no reason that we should as a society support education starting at age five and not education starting at age, you know, zero. Thanks, Anna. I, Ellen, and then we'll go I, to Janet. I was just thinking that this week um, we've we've experienced a major surge in COVID cases and we have um, about 30 that we're actively dealing with right now, um, which is a large percentage of our school. And when I hear we're coming out of COVID, COVID's ending, this is the highest we've had in two years. This is the biggest 
surge. We have the most children out. They're missing school. Their parents are missing work. It's spreading throughout the household. And that means that some families are out of work for a month. Um, and so while COVID may be ending for those of us who don't have young children and who are vaccinated and able to work from home, COVID is not ending for the families that we're serving. It's actually worse than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. um, we're at a, the height of COVID right now. And to expect that we'd be out of it in June in two months, it's just not, that's impossible. We will not be out of it because people are gonna lose jobs from being out of them for a month. And um, so we are, uh, I think, I think that's not well understood. And I just wanna emphasize, this is the height of COVID this week for us. Us too, yeah. Uh, I just wanna say, I just wanted to, uh, what Lori say that is very scary, the future. Uh, I think that it is, I am very, Sad to see the statistics that uh, uh, um, uh, Lauren uh, shared at the beginning. Seventy percent of the fourteen hundred programs were family that closed through, uh, from March twenty twenty to now. Seventy percent is family child care. So I feel that we need uh, support. The children need support and the community and now, and all of us deserve that. I feel that we need education on how we can access different economic opportunities and clear expectations around grant requirements and responsibilities, especially because a high percentage of family child care educators uh, are people that English is not the first language and we need that support and that education as well. Thank you so much. I, I just want to thank each of you for joining us today under incredible circumstances. I know you have things on both sides of your camera going on now. And I, I really want to thank you for that. I also want to thank um, Jeanette for that kind of that that summary of thinking about the future and um, and all the kind of realness that your perspectives have provided to all the statistics that we have. And this and and one of the most exciting parts about the grant was that we, we, we gave funding out to programs with to say, let's figure this out together. So the spirit of cooperation, we know there are, are improvements that can be made. We know we wanna think about more about how are we best serving the most vulnerable families? So whether, how are we collecting parent income information in, in the name of trying to help support them better? So we know there are really big opportunities uh, to think about how we really move this forward. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Lauren for some final uh, comments and then to close us out. Great, and um, I just wanna echo, thank you so much um, to, our, to our provider panel for the incredible work that you do. Um, with respect to the C3 grants, we've talked a lot about the investment that you make in your educators and, and staff. And I think we don't talk about the directors and the administrators enough. And without these funds, I mean, my guess is without making assumptions that you're substituting in classrooms because you have shortages, that you're working the front desk because there isn't somebody to work the front desk, that you're managing facilities while you're trying to operate a school. We would not tolerate that in an elementary school. You deserve the, the, the support <laughs> and the financial um, investment that allows you to do your job um, because we also know we're losing directors and we're losing family child care providers, not just because the budgets don't balance, because they're burned out, because it's too hard. And it should not be too hard um, for you, as well as for your educators, as well as for children uh, and, and certainly the families who are relying on the incredible education and care um, that, that you provide um, to thousands of families across uh, Massachusetts. So I just wanted to say that. And then uh, lastly, just a reminder that we need you to join us, right, in asking for what it is, not just that what we want, but what we deserve as a community, um, which is at the very least the extension of these Commonwealth Cares for Children stabilization grants. So um, for all of you joining who haven't yet, um, please raise your voice, advocate, to Beacon Hill, to your legislators, to your state senators, to your governor, um, that you really need this to be a budget priority. I think also really important points that were raised 
is this eligibility needs to be for all providers in this moment. Um, Ellen, as you were saying, COVID is still going for this field. It's not behind us. Um, and it sounds like in this moment, it is perhaps more challenging than it has been uh, in the last you know, several months, if not two years. So we want going forward to think about C3 as a way that is equitable for the field, how we use it to achieve these greater policy goals. But in this moment, in this next six months, in this next 12 months, recognizing that our field is still in crisis conditions. So please join us in asking for that $480 million um, for fiscal year 2023. In follow-up, we will send you materials on, on how to participate um, in this and uh, that, you know, we have to stand together. And please also, you know, send anybody our way as you're hearing from parents, as you're hearing from coworkers, um, because we're just so excited to find ways to come together and to partner, as Amy said, um, with our government to make Massachusetts a phenomenal place um, to work as an early education provider or teacher, and also to find really high quality care uh, as a family. So with that, thank you again. Thank you for all of our participants and keep an eye out. We'll follow up with additional information as well as the deck and some supporting um, additional detail.